My name is Pastor Sean. If you're in the room, would you go ahead and stand as you are able? Let's prepare to worship God. If you're watching online, worship with us on there. I invite you to, whatever posture is comfortable, let's worship God together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. To the head and an outstretched arm. His love endures. 
is forever for the life that's been reborn his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing praise sing praise forever god is faithful forever god is strong forever god is with us forever 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 from the rising sun to the setting sun his love endures forever by the grace of god we will carry on his love endures forever sing praise sing Amen. And amen. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Kathy. What a joy it is to be able to worship this morning. Once again, good morning. It is good to see you all this morning, whether you're worshiping online or whether you are here in the building. Happy Pentecost Sunday to you, the birth of the church. Happy birthday to God's church. Uh, a couple of announcements for you as we prepare to jump in. The first, uh, thing I'll tell you is this, if you go to our weekly email, either because you receive it or because you scan the QR code that's on the screens or in front of you, that has all the information. If you go to our newsletter, I'm going to hit the highlights. That has all the information on what's going on. Make sure you pay attention to that or sign up for that if you do not already receive it. First thing I want to let you know about is the beginning on June the 19th. That is in two weeks. On June the 19th, we will move to a one-service schedule for the summer. Uh, with folks traveling and folks in and out of town, it's just simpler to do one service, and we get to see everybody that's part of the church in church each Sunday as opposed to having two separate services. That'll be at 10 a.m. each Sunday. That is a time change, 10 a.m. each Sunday. For those of you who worship online with us, that will also move to 10 a.m. Uh, starting on the 19th of June in two weeks. We look forward to seeing you for that. Our June collection items for the St. Thomas Food Pantry are rice, cookies, both individual size servings as well as family size packages, and granola bars. Uh, you'll notice two of those three things are things that children need big time when they're not in school, when they don't have snacks. So let's get those in throughout the month of June. We'll get them down to the food pantry. Also, they have added, as we talked about last week, a second day of service, not just on the weekend. They're now open on Wednesday evenings as well for clients, uh, which is an incredible thing. That's how much need they have going on. They're able to meet that, but they do need some volunteers. If you're available from about 3 until 7 on Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, once a week or every week, and you'd like to be a part of that or learn more about that, contact Fabian Wilson, contact Kathy Clark in the church office. We will get you in touch with the folks you need to be in touch with to start serving on Wednesdays if that is something you feel called to do. Also, our June blood drive is coming up on June the 23rd right here in our fellowship hall from 12 to 5. If you scan that QR code or if you're in the building, scan the QR codes on any of the uh, posters that are out there in the lobby. You can take there, make an appointment for a simple 20 minutes of your time and a little bit of your blood. You can save up to three lives. Uh, this is going to be our, I think, our fourth blood drive, third or fourth blood drive we've been doing since December of this year. And we look forward to having you there and serving our community at our blood drive. I'm going to invite Roger Rogers to come up and lead us in our call to worship and our psalm reading. But first, let's have a brief prayer while he's coming up. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the wondrous weather. We thank you for the wonders of your Holy Spirit. May it move in a mighty way once again today and inspire us as individuals and us as a church to fulfill the call you've put on our lives. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Roger? This Pentecost Sunday, the um, psalm reading is of, from 140, Psalm 140, um, uh, from 31 to 35. May the, Lord of, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it, and, and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Blessed the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join me in the call to worship. When the world divides us. Come, Holy Spirit, make us one. When the world calls us orphaned. Come, Holy Spirit, Spirit make, make us, us family. family. When the world leads us astray. Come, come Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, call us home. Come, come Holy Spirit, Spirit, come. Come and fill this place. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite those who are joining the church this morning to come forward as we welcome them into new membership today. That's you. Go. <laughs> the rest of our 1030 folks came at 9 and joined at 930, so, or 9 o'clock. So if you'd come down here, I'll come on up. Come on. Come on. Let's do it. Today at Pentecost, we will welcome new members. We welcome several new members at our 9 o'clock service, and we're welcoming uh, the Lemke, Lemke, as you say it, right? Lemke family this morning as well. I'm going to ask you some questions, and then I'll invite you, the congregation, both online and in the room, to respond. It's not just a promise they're making, but a promise renewing a promise that you and I have made when we became part of this church. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, will you say, I do? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? Do you, Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? You do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust in God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. And as members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to, the Christ, to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries. I will. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend to your love and care these persons now before you. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you. As as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I pray your blessing upon the Lemkes, upon all the families that have joined Buckhall Church today. We celebrate and we rejoice we rejoice as well, Lord, that this is folks that you can work through. They're not adding to our number, Lord. They are part of your number. And we praise God for all that they will bring to the ministries of your church in this place that we call Buckhall. I pray your blessing upon them and upon each and every member of this church that we may faithfully live out the vows that we have made in your name. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.
I'm going to give you this, Thomas. I forgot to do this at the first service, so I'll get those books later. Uh, but we got new stickers, Buck Hall Church stickers. Uh, they're out in the lobby. If you right on the first table to your left when you walk out, if you're online, you want one, send an email to the church, info at Buck Hall Church. We'll get one to you. Um, they're out here. There's a free will offering available if you'd like to give a little money for them. If not, it's okay. Uh, but these stickers, put them on your Yetis, put them on your computers, put them wherever you go. These people might see the great things that are going on in and around Buck Hall Church. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Olive. There you go. Welcome to the church. The kids that are headed to Sunday school can head off with Miss Kathy now or headed to the nursery as we move into our time of prayer this morning. I only had a couple of listed prayer concerns today. One is for uh, Allison Clark's trip to Texas. We pray for her as she goes through continued testing. Uh, pray for good results that they will be able to move to the next stage of their treatment uh, for her and for her cancer as well. Prayers for the AIDS and Life Cycle Riders and Support Staff, which is thousands of folks who are making a 545-mile, is it a bicycle ride, Susan? 545-mile bicycle ride from San Francisco to L.A. starting today to raise awareness to hopefully find a, a fund, find a solution to solve and get rid of AIDS. So we pray for them as they go through that journey today. And of course, we pray for all those who are traveling. We have many in our congregation who are tra starting to Travel for the holidays, or the summer holidays, traveling to see family. We pray for them, and they continue to rejoice uh, that they make things safely on their journeys. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, all those things that break our hearts, the, the needs in our lives and the lives of our loved ones, we lift them up to you. There are joys in our life, Lord, we lift those up to you as well. We rejoice with those who are on the road to recovery, but who still need your healing hand and your strength. We mourn with those who mourn, and we walk together hand in hand, side by side with those who are in the darkest valleys. May your spirit abide with each one of these. May your spirit be alive in us. May your Holy Spirit come down upon us fresh anew today we celebrate the birthday of the church, the pouring out of your spirit upon your disciples. May we look to move forward as a church while remembering all the wonderful things you have done and looking expectantly at the things you will do. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. In 1945, a few years ago, after World War II, a husband and wife team got together and decided they were going to start a business. They were going to do some woodworking, and they were going to build picture frames. Now, if you've ever built picture frames, you know that can be a, a lot of work. It can be a lot of woodworking, and the husband, Elliot, he loved that. But it also meant, if you've ever built frames, you get a lot of scrap wood, and he didn't want to waste the scrap wood, so he started building dollhouses for the kids around them. And people absolutely love them, and they realized there was a need. Picture frames were great, but there was a need for toys, because in 1945, there weren't a whole lot of specialty toy companies for children. And so they began to make these dollhouses and some other things, and their first official toy was this, in 1948, called the uke a doodle Anybody ever seen one of those? No? Okay. Goes back a little too far for some of you. But uke a doodle was the first toy they made, and they were so successful making this and other toys that by 1955, they were one of the first toy manufacturers to go on television and advertise, and they were one of the first advertisers on the original version of the Mickey Mouse Club. 1955. In 1959, they came up with a new concept, a new toy to reach little girls. It was called Barbie. 1959. Barbie and Barbie's dollhouse a few years later that was actually made out of cardboard and not wood. I don't know why, but that's how it was. And then in 1968, they, they came up with an invention near and dear to my heart and millions of young children's hearts, and they called it Hot Wheels. You know, Hot Wheels? Yeah. I loved them. Didn't realize how much I loved them until my mom dug them out for my son and how many I had that I didn't realize I even had hundreds of them at my house as a child. As time went on, of course, the company is Mattel, now known as Mattel. As they went on throughout the decades, they continued to reinvent themselves, they continued to grow, they continued to do new things, to reach and feel 
what was a perceived need among the families and the children in the world. By the year 2000, they were the first company to be making licensed Disney princess dolls other than Disney themselves. In 2002, they got the rights to all of Warner Brothers stuff, Harry Potter, Batman, Superman, all of that. They are constantly looking for the next edge, the next new thing in the toy world. They always are thinking outside the box. And people who think outside the box know that they need to think outside the box. Because in order to continue to survive and thrive, especially in business, they know they have to keep reinventing themselves. Being outside of the box means we will adapt to our circumstances. Now, one of the, I love to find inspiration from business leaders. Because business leaders, people in the church world want to think church and business are separate. And they are. But leadership is leadership. And there's wonderful things to be gained from a lot of leaders in the business world. And one of my favorite business leaders in the entire world, one of the, the best of all time, is a guy by the name of Michael Scott from The Office. Anybody ever seen that show? No. Michael Scott, his second rule, his second principle of business was you have to adapt, react, readapt, and then act. Adapt, react, then readapt and act. It makes a lot of sense. How well do you and I, how well do we adapt? How well do we do when challenges enter our lives or our relationships? When someone says to you, it says, you're in the box, that's not usually a compliment, right? You're seeing you're stuck in your ways, you're stuck in saying those seven deadly words, we've always done it that way. You and I, we have to get outside the box. We have to break out of our boxes and be looking, breaking out of our presuppositions, our assumptions, our comfort and looking for new ways to do the things we've always done. If the box teaches us anything, and I was going to have a giant box up here for demonstration purposes to show breaking out of the box, but we're moving, uh, we're buying a new house, and we're moving to that house the next couple weeks, and I, my wife would not like it if I wasted a box sitting up here empty for six weeks during a sermon series. So imagine a giant box over here. Right? But here's the thing about a box. If we think about being in the box, it reminds us that if we do what we've always done, we will get what we've always gotten. Even if we say, I'm just going to work harder, I'm just going to do, do a more of what I've been doing, you're not going to get new results, you're going to get more of what you had been getting. Maybe in your career, you come across the same challenge, same, same advice, same directors from on high, and the same result keeps happening. Maybe it's time to think outside the box. And in this series, we're going to be in the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at the story of the early church, Look at how they learn to think outside the box. It's this most, one of the most significant pivots from the Gospel of John to the book of Acts. One of the most significant pivots in all of human history. The era of the Son of God has a new chapter. The page has turned. It is different. This new covenant community begins to exist that we call the church. New characters are introduced. The Holy Spirit becomes a, a very real part of their existence. The mission is the same, but the methods are going to change in the book of Acts. People of God are going to grapple with what does it mean that the Spirit is here with us, and how does that change how we live? They're going to be invited to rethink who God is and what God is up to and how God works, because they had put God in a box. And I think you and I, we all have, we put God in a box, or we try to. But God is consistently challenging those notions, those assumptions, Challenging us to live and think outside the box. Because the box, remember, is our creation. God did not create a box. We made a box. So if you have your Bibles with you today, go ahead and turn, or your, your devices, turn to Acts chapter 1. It's a reminder as we go into Acts that, that I always encourage folks to bring your own Bibles to church or bring your Bible app so that when you take notes, you have them when you go home. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 1 this morning. And we're going to see God moving himself outside of the box and from a temple to a presence among the people. And we're going to look about why that's significant and what does it mean for you and me. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Here we go. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, 
But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Friends, if we're going to be a people who steward the mission and message of God well, but continue to break out of our boxes, the first thing we have to do is we need to have to learn to go forward and not backwards. To move forwards and not backwards. In the very first verse there, Luke says, I'm writing to you, dear Theophilus. And in the first book I wrote, I dealt with all that Jesus did and taught. If you have a Bible underlined, to do and to teach. He says in the first book, now Luke wrote two books. The book of Acts and the gospel of? Luke wrote the gospel of Luke, right? Now, scholars will tell you that the what probably reality is that those two books originally were one volume, split into two. And it, for some reason, when they put the books in order, they split them up in the canon thousands of years ago. But he says, in the first book, Theophilus, the Gospel of Luke, I told you all that Jesus began to do and teach, and the people who would have heard this, who would have read this instantly, would have said, yeah, that's great, but what do we do now? Jesus isn't here anymore. He's gone, he's died, he's risen, he's ascended to heaven How are we going to do all that Jesus told us to do without Jesus? And in the midst of this new community that's being birthed by the power of the Spirit, the Holy Church, this is going to be a lesson. This book is going to be a lesson on how do we do that. This is how the mission is going to continue. How Jesus, all that he taught and all that he did, will be transformed and put into new words by the power of the Spirit. That's why the title of this book is The Acts of the Apostles. This is mission 2.0. It's continuing the work of Jesus, but it's doing it in new ways. We have to move forward and not backward. Luke also says that Jesus presented himself alive to the apostles by many convincing proofs. How convinced were they after those 40 days? Remember that all but one of the apostles, all but John, went to their deaths as martyrs for the faith. That's how convinced they were. You can build up a lie. You you can tell a falsehood for a while. But you don't go to your death as martyrs. And the scripture tells us that more than 500 followers of Jesus were martyred for their faith in the early years of the church. That's how committed they were, how convinced they were that Jesus was who he said he was. And Jesus stays, Jesus is with them, and he's convinced them that he is the Son of God and that that his word is truth. And he says, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And now one final time, we talked about this at the end of last week's service, one final time, the disciples, before Jesus goes to heaven, Jesus, the apostles need one more, you still don't get it moment. They say, Jesus, does this mean you're going to bring back the kingdom of Israel? You know what they're saying? Can we go back there? Hundreds of years. We've heard the stories about the good old days. We've heard the stories about King David, about King Solomon. But the days when Israel had political power and had military might and borders were defended and we didn't have any oppressors in the land, we had enough, everybody had plenty. Can we go back to those days? This is the New Testament version of the question asked in Exodus when the people begin to grumble against Moses and say we need to find a new leader who will take us back to Egypt. We have a long history of humans of looking backwards of saying, we want to go back to that. That's what these disciples are saying. Can you restore that kingdom? And I love Jesus' answers, because he doesn't actually answer the question, right? Jesus answers the question by redirecting and saying, you don't even get what I'm trying to say. But you will receive power. It's not for you to know the details, but you're going to receive the Spirit in a few days. And the Spirit will come upon you, and you will learn, will come in the future, to move forward with the Spirit. We've got to go forward and not backwards. This is a new stage in the redemptive story of God's love for his people. It's the same mission God's always had, but it's a new mode. You see, Jesus himself was what the disciples, not what they expected, but he was so much greater than what they imagined. They said to Jesus, you're you're here to get rid of Rome, right? You're here to get rid of the oppressive regime. 
And Jesus said, no, I'm here to get rid of your true oppressor, sin. They said, you're going to restore us to our national identity. You're going to make us great again. You're going to bring us that salvation. And Jesus said, no, this isn't about you or a people. This is about all the people, Gentiles included. Jesus was not what they expected, but he was so much greater than they imagined. And Jesus, I found Jesus is always teaching me this. When I try to box him into a nice, convenient little package, he begins to shatter those categories, to shatter those suppositions. And he says, I'm not what you expected, but I'm so much greater than you could have ever imagined. And the Holy Spirit does the same thing. We have seen in this country, we've seen Judeo-Christian values go from front and center in the world to off relegated to a side post. And some people are still grappling with that in the wake of, of what's happened. What are we doing? How did we get here? How did we go, quote unquote, backwards to this? It used to be a place where we could have prayer in school or we could have the Ten Commandments posted on every government building, all that kind of stuff. And here's the thing. The world has shifted. Times have changed. We can't go backwards. Why do we treat trying to reach backwards for methods that don't, aren't grounded in reality, that aren't grounded in today? But I want to be sensitive because for a lot of folks, that is a real grief. That loss is a real grief. And I say to you, grieve well, but then let's keep going. You see, outside of the enemy himself, Satan, the accuser, the, the evil one, two of the greatest threats to the future of the church are fundamentalism and progressivism. Now those words, progress, fundamentals, they're, they're good on their own. We, we should have fundamentals, right? Every sport, every skill is based on fundamentals. But when you stick that ism on the end of it, it becomes a problem, right? One of the things that I'm really passionate about is taking those fundamental truths of Scripture, the ancient stories, and putting them in a language where people who've never set foot in the church will understand what Jesus is trying to say. I like to think about it as an old school heart with a new school kind of mouth. I want to speak in a way that invites people who've never heard the story to hear the story. And it's not wrong to have fundamentals, but fundamentalism says we can never change. Nothing can ever change. We've always done it that way. Jesus Christ himself read the Bible out of the King James Version. No, he didn't, right? It's things like, think about this. If you have, how many of you have, have gotten new tires on your car recently? Anybody? Right? The technology they have in tires today is crazy. Kevlar, run flat, all that stuff. Fundamentalism is saying, well, you know, my ancestors had a wooden wagon wheel, so I'm going to put those on my car. It worked for them, it'll work for me. Right? That, that's not right. It's confusing the God of old with the old things of God. And the fundamentalism says things can never change. Progressivism says everything has to change. It's never good enough as it was. Everything needs to develop. That wheel that you were going to put on your car, that tire, you know, I, I heard that if you take a square wheel and you go fast enough on a smooth enough surface, you'll never notice you're not on a round tire. So let's start selling square tires. Literally reinventing the wheel. Right? All the old stuff is bad. All that tradition, all that stuff is just needs to be thrown by the wayside. We need to keep moving forward no matter what is in front of us. We need to be seeking progress, but we don't need to throw out the fundamental bones of our faith. We've been given reliable eyewitness testimony, Luke says. Reliable stories in the book of Acts and in the Gospels. People who believe so much they went to their death for that truth. And it's good to have a high view of Scripture. We, it's trustworthy. We can stand on it. So if the bones are good... We hold on to the bones, and we keep moving forward. But both fundamentalism and progressivism make different mistakes. They're a threat to how we go forward well. Dave Kinnaman wrote a book in 2012 called Unchristian. Did anybody read that book? No, I didn't think you did. It sold about a bunch of copies. I think they were all to church leaders and church denominational leaders who read it. But he did a, Dave Kinnaman did a study with Barna. Not a, a poll, but a study of unchurched people, people who've never set foot in a church, never been raised in church, don't know anything about the church from the inside. And he did this long study and they found out, what do you think, what do you know about Christians? What do you think you know about Christians? And here's what they said. Christians are hypocritical. They cannot be trusted. They're homophobic. They're sheltered. They're too political. And they're judgmental. 
Friends, I don't know about you, but I would love to work really hard at breaking out of the box of that perception. And leading with truth and leading with grace and showing the world that that's not who we really are. But the only people that can do that is you and me. Dave Kinnaman can write a book all he wants to. They're never going to read it. They're never going to set foot in the building. We need to be that message to them. We need to hold on to our mission, and when we hold on to it well, we are then free to shift how we spread the mission. We're free to shift the mode, the methods. When we're laser-focused on why we're seeking to reach people, we're free to shift how we reach people. And that will help us to move forward and not backwards. Secondly, if we're going to break out of our boxes, we need to allow disruption to our present order. How many of you like disruption in your lives? How many of you have disruption in your lives? Oh, that's what I thought. I hate disruption with a burning passion. I do not do well with spontaneity unless I have planned the spontaneity, and it's no longer spontaneous to me. When we go on vacation, even when, when knowing we're going on vacation for a couple of days before we go, I'm like, I'm preparing my mind for a new existence. When the kids get out of school in a week or so, yeah, a week, right? They get out of school in a week. It's going to be a new world for a couple months. Things are a little bit different. Routines shift. I don't do well with that because I like my safety. I like my control. I don't like disruption, but we need disruption. Sometimes we choose our own disruption. Maybe you graduate from high school and you decide to go to college far away from home where nobody will be tempted to visit you. That's a transition. That's a disruption. Take a core relationship you have to the next level or you end a core relationship in your life. That's disruption. Marriage is a disruption for better or for worse, right? Kids are a disruption. When we had our first kid, it was like, this is a disruption, but man, this is a beautiful disruption. And then when we had our second kid, it was like, okay, now it's just a disruption. Uh, I can't imagine those of you who have more than two kids, how you have done it, I don't know, right? But sometimes disruptions happen. Sometimes they're good disruptions, sometimes they're things that happen, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of a relationship. But the question for us is when disruptions occur, what is our posture towards them? Is it surrender or is it resistance? Surrender or resistance? It makes all the difference in the world which one of those we choose. There's a direct correlation between our ability to handle disruption and our growth process as disciples. Let's skip forward to Acts chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles. Chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what Luke says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They were used to that. They they were safe. Then suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. That's disruption. But it's not, not the end. Then they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Disruption. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's some serious disruption. Disruption in the room, they're speaking in tongues that nobody understands. They didn't know the language. Other people weren't sure what was going on. It caused a disruption so great, it wasn't just in this room, but it was in throughout the crowd. And then in verse 14, Peter stands up with the 11 apostles. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this chaos to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. That was the rumor that was going around. It is only nine in the morning. I imagine some Yahoo in the back and flip-flops saying, it's five o'clock somewhere, though. And Peter says, he goes on to quote the book of Joel. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on your people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. God is saying, I'm doing something new, but it's going to require an almighty disruption. It might sound strange. It might feel strange. It might feel uncomfortable. Will you embrace it? Can you allow it to happen? You have to understand that for the disciples in the early age, they were all Jewish. And for them, this whole concept of Jesus as Messiah was a world-shaking concept. It disrupted all the things they thought they knew about God, all the things that thousands of years of family and community had passed down to them. 
They're grappling throughout the book of Acts on what does it mean to be a resurrected people. How does it change how we reach others? We don't like disruption, but so often it is exactly what you and I need. How many of you have ever had your life disturbed by Jesus or by the Spirit? No. So often when that happens, the immediate reaction, much like Peter when he's reinstated, isn't to say thank you. It's to say, why are you bothering me? I was perfectly happy, Jesus. I was plodding along in my life Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, happy as a clam, and then you had to show up. Why have you come to disturb us? But you see, there's a cyclical nature of growth that is centered around disorder, or order, disorder, and reorder. We like order, and order is not really a bad thing, but it's not good for our spiritual health. There has to be disorder in life, because out of disorder comes growth. Out of disorder comes spiritual development. And we're invited to move forward in a new direction. It happens in your relationships. Think about all the great times in your family or your spouse or whoever you have in your core relationships. And everything's going great. Everything's copacetic. You're cruising in life. That's not where we grow closer together, is it? When do we grow in our relationships? In times of trouble, in times of pain, in times of conflict. It's a season of perhaps taking the walls that we've kind of constructed around ourselves and God tearing them down and saying, go and do this new thing. That's what brings us closer together in relationships. We need the disorder. It brings us into new life, new ways of being. There's a statistic that is thrown around all the time that the average marriage in our culture does not last more than eight years. And I often will tell new couples when I'm doing wedding counseling, premarital counseling, that the only reason that is true in nine times out of ten is that before they got to the eight-year mark, so they were in had their lives in order. Some disorder interrupted their lives, and they didn't pivot. They didn't reorient. They didn't go into reordering. They bailed. Other people will tell you that you will be married in your life four to five times in your life. The question is, will it be to the same person or not? Because sometimes as things shift, our relationships shift, we shift. And if we don't shift, it all falls apart. We have to relearn, we're constantly rethinking, we're constantly recategorizing and shifting and being flexible, being radically flexible and being spiritually nimble and able to go where God is leading us. So we have to allow disruption to our present order. Lastly, if we're going to be people who live well outside the box, we need to trust and receive the new normal. Now I know this phrase has baggage for some people because we've said it for two years now. But I want you to not think about it in those terms. Think about it as trusting, receiving, what's next. Any of y'all ever grow up or your kids grow up with Nintendo game systems or Game Boys? Right? Anybody ever play uh, Super Mario Brothers? Yeah. What was the, the one bad thing about Super Mario Brothers? You couldn't save your progress. You were on level one, you got to level seven, you're about to get to Bowser's Castle, and it all, you had to go call for dinner or call to go somewhere to go. And what did you tell everybody around you? Do not touch that thing. Don't turn it off. Don't unplug it. Don't do anything. Because if you do, I've got to start over again. And we spent hours and hours doing the same task again and again. And we kept being told as kids in, in our generation, stop playing video games. We were the first generation to be told that. Stop playing video games because you'll never make a living doing it. Go do something more productive. I found myself a couple of years ago to saying to a former student who was talking about that, I said, you know you'll never make a living doing that. And as I said it, I was reminded, you know what they have these days? They have full scholarships to universities for electronic sports, for video games. People get paid tons and tons of money to be developers and testers and create new video game experiences. It's just not true anymore. You can't tell your kids you can't make a living playing video games because guess what? They probably could today. And as much as that pains me to say that, and it probably pains some of you. The reality has shifted. It's not, a, it's not a thing I can avoid. It is reality. What do we do with it? What about the larger examples of new normals in our life? When the pandemic hit, this is where this phrase came from, right? How are we going to teach? How are we going to worship? How are we going to live? How are we going to coexist in this new world? How do we trust and receive what God is going to have for us on the other side? 
But when we trust and receive, when we trust the voice of the one who created the world instead of the voice of the world, when we trust the creator of the world, we will receive and trust in that new normal because we trust and receive that God is, God is the new normal. We need to be a people not of the past, but a people of the future who hold on to our heritage. But we also need to not run so fast that we leave all of that behind. We got to keep moving forward, but to do that, we need to trust and receive that what is to come will be of God. We trust and receive. Because here's the truth, when we don't accept the present reality, we will never be present in that reality. And if the world, friends, is crying out for anything, whether they know it or not, the world is crying out for a rooted and a grounded and a non-anxious people who are present in the same reality they are present in, but who tell a different story, who tell a different truth, the truth. But just so we understand what God is up to, how difficult this was, I'm going to take you through a quick and dirty summation of all the disruption in the history of God's presence with his people. In Genesis chapter 12, God comes to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to leave everything you know, all your family, all your land, all your people, and get out. Where am I going? I don't, I'm not telling you where you're going, just go. And out of you, I will make a great nation. He has kids, they have kids, and they end up with Joseph. I remember Joseph, right? Joseph goes down to Egypt, and he ends up being a big shot in the Egyptian empire. His family comes down into Egypt, and everything is going great, and then the Pharaoh forgets Joseph. And the people are stuck in Egypt in slavery. And then God raises up Moses to rescue them out of Egypt, and he delivers them out of Egypt. And they get to the wilderness, and they're on the way to the promised land. But because they are so afraid of change, they don't trust Moses. They don't trust God, and they end up in that fear just circling, literally walking in circles for 40 years instead of going to the promised land. And then Moses, while they're in the promised land, Moses stops by local Dick Sporting Goods in the middle of the valley. He buys the biggest tent he can find called the tabernacle. And he follows God's instructions, and in that holy of holies, God resides, God descends, and God is with his people. There's a high priest who was the only one that could go in and encounter that God. This is where people would bring their prayers and their sacrifices. This is where God's house was. And then finally in Joshua, Joshua leads the people into the promised land. And they go through the whole process of building up their nation. They get to the point where they have kings. They get to David. David says to God, I want to build you a house. And David said, or God says to David, absolutely not. I'm going to build you a house. Out of you will come a line from which my Savior will be born. And God says, I also don't want you to build me a building. I'm going to let your son do that. So Solomon builds Solomon's temple, one of the grandest buildings ever built. And when the spirit descends into the temple, the temple is so filled with smoke and fire, there's no room for worship or talk, but it's simply filled with the presence of God. And then the people of God forfeit their right to be with God by, because they forget who God is. They forget their promises to God. And in Ezekiel, we get the, this haunting line, the glory of God has departed from the temple. Ichabod, the presence is gone. And that's a problem. If you're a faithful Jew, you're a faithful follower of God, where are you going to go now? Where are you going to worship this God? How do you meet with God? So then they reconstruct the temple when they come back. But guess what? There's no presence in the temple. God isn't dwelling in that temple. And then in Luke chapter 2, a young baby named Jesus is brought to the temple to be dedicated. And once again, God is in the temple. But he doesn't stay there. And then in Acts chapter 1 and in Acts chapter 2, what does it say? It says the Spirit of God descended like tongues of fire over the apostles. And now God moves his temple from a building to a people. So now that wherever two or more are gathered in my name, he says, there will be temple presence. There can be worship. So that where one of us goes, even to the ends of the earth, God is with us. God dwells in his people. God dwells in you and in me all because God wanted to break outside of the box. And if we want to be a people who meet God, a God who's outside of the box that we've tried to put him in, we need to learn to live lives outside the box that look different, that are different, 
that our lives and the tone of our speech are categorized by love and by grace, and by mercy and by compassion. That we hold on to the eternal truths that we've been given because it is the truth. And we move forward with gracious speech and behavior towards those who don't yet understand. That we offer forgiveness to those who hurt us. That we're willing to speak truth, not only when it benefits us, but we're willing to speak truth even when it costs us something. And in order to do that, friends, we need to be a people empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because we can't do it on our own. That's why the Holy Spirit is poured out on Pentecost. Because we can't do it ourselves. We need to live transformed lives as a people and as communities. People are looking for convincing proofs today that Jesus is alive. John Wesley wrote in the 1700s that people all have a God-shaped hole in their heart. They may not know how to express that, but they're longing for the presence of Jesus in their lives because we were created to be one with Jesus. And they're looking around for answers, friends. They're looking at you, looking at me, they're looking at our communities. They're reading our lives. They're reading us to see if this Jesus is real. May we live our lives outside of our own boxes. May we break out of those. Be reminded that our call is to be people who live a different life. But to do that, we need a power that isn't our own. If we're going to go out and we're going to break out of our boxes, we need to have the strength and the courage and the fortitude to remember that no matter where we go, no matter how uncomfortable we might be, no matter how dangerous it might seem, no matter how weird it might seem, remember that God is with us. And wherever we are, there God is. And but for the grace of God, go we. Let's bring that message and that mission to the world. Let's pray. Father God, we've been given so many things. We've been given so much grace and love and goodness from you. Help us to get out of our own way. Help us to stop getting in the way of the things that you're trying to do. I pray, Lord, today on Pentecost for revival. Just as the apostles experienced the outpouring of your spirit, may we receive the outpouring of your spirit today. For some, Lord, it's hard to go forward. Give them courage and faith. For some, it's it's hard to hold on to the truth that we've learned while looking forward, help us to trust in your truth. I pray, Lord, throughout this Pentecost season, you would break open our boxes, break open our categories, our assumptions, break us up, that we might be bent and shaped into your will, that we might be invited to think and feel and learn and grow differently. And we thank you for all the new ways that you continually are reshaping your people to become your kingdom. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As we prepare to come to the communion table, a couple of reminders for you this morning. One, a reminder this table is not mine, it is not Buck Hall's, it is not a Methodist table. This table is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all are welcome and encouraged to come and taste and see that our Lord is good. If you're in the room this morning, when we get to the time to receive communion, you'll be invited down by row. You'll receive a piece of bread and an individual cup of communion juice. I invite you to consume those. And then you can place the uh, cups in the trash can up here or in the back on your way out. If you are at home worshiping with us online today, I would invite you to pray a prayer of spiritual communion that will be on the screen as a way to experience the taste and the graciousness of our Lord through the power of prayer. I also will let you know if you need a gluten-free or a vegan-free option when you come forward, we have a wafer that is that. Just let me know, and I'd be happy to serve that to you. Let us go to God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, you have always fulfilled your promises. You have always lived up to your bargains. It is we who fall short. When we fall short of your glory, when we mistake things, when we do things we shouldn't have or say things we shouldn't have or don't do the things you have us do, when we fail to live up to our end of the bargain, Lord, we come and we ask for your forgiveness. 
We name those things before you. We ask that you would make us right again. And then we leave them at the foot of your cross that we might be freed for a joyful obedience to you. Amen. That night in the upper room with disciples gathered around what we now know is the Last Supper. Those disciples didn't know that. Jesus did. And in his final time with them as a gathered group before he went to the cross, he took the bread, he gave thanks to God for it, and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to God. He passed it around. He said, take and drink from this, each of you. This is a new covenant. The blood of your Savior, the blood of your friend, the blood of your rabbi poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Poured out so that all of God's children might come to know God's love and God's grace. Thanks be to God. Father God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here this day and on these gifts of the field and the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion, Lord, with your church throughout the world. Strengthen in every nation, in every town, and in every household. Pour out your Spirit upon us again new. Open our hearts to receive it, that by your Spirit we might be made one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes again in final victory, and we feast together with him at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Invite our communion stewards to come forward and invite our ushers to begin directing you down. The table is prepared. Come and taste and see that our Lord is good. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus, give me Jesus.
I invite you to stand as you are able to join us in our closing hymn, closing song this morning, 10,000 Reasons. want to sing like we've never sung before that means we can't sing what we were singing yesterday it means we can't be focused on the things the old things of God our worship of the God of old our service to the God of old our mission to fulfill for the God of old needs new wineskins it needs new ways to develop it needs to be nimble and looking forwards and not back. As the Spirit descends on us again and afresh anew each day, may we be empowered and emboldened to go and do that work in ways we've never even imagined. Go in the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and with you always. Amen. Amen.